All right. Well, uh, thank you, Jim, for putting this together. Uh, you know, greatly enjoying this, uh, this whole workshop so far. It's wonderful to have many people who are thinking in similar ways in the same room. Uh, so I'm Frank Notaft. I'm a grad student at UC Berkeley. And I'll be talking today about some of the uh, work that we've been doing on the Atom project, uh, specifically what we're looking at in terms of variant calling and discovery. And so as a... Uh, you know, kind of as, as motivation for this, I, I think a lot of us are coming from the same perspective. We see a, you know, this new world of genomics that is moving towards a very data intensive look at the genomic data. And part of this is driven by people who are doing uh, population scale experiments. Uh, you know, it's like we talk about new projects, whether it's something like the Framingham Heart and Lung or, you know, the uh, UK 100K, or I guess 100K for UK. And, yeah, you know, we're looking at population scale experiments that are generating, you know, not just terabytes of data, but instead, you know, maybe up to 20 petabytes of data. At the same point in time, when we're, you know, if we're if we're in a clinical case, you know, in a clinical case, we we may not care about the ability to integrate across 100,000 samples, but latency is very important to us. You know, we're we're involved in a project that's uh, trying to do some targeted treatment for patients who uh, present in a clinic with a acute myeloid leukemia, and in, in this case, we have an analysis timeline that's about three days. Uh, and, you know, if we look at current variant calling pipelines that take about 170 hours end to end, you know, seven days is, is a bit longer than three days. And we, we think that this is going to be a, uh, an increasingly big, uh, big pattern in uh, clinical genomics. And, and finally, the last thing that we want to do in each case is that we always want to analyze across samples. You know, if I'm in a clinic, you know, it may be I'm not, I'm not going to go ahead and joint call 100,000 samples, but I'm going to have, you know, a steady stream of five leukemia patients who come in a week, and I'm going to want to say, hey, you know, we, we've seen these point mutations in the past 30, you know, past 30 leukemia patients. We'll use those as a prior for the next leukemia patient that comes in. Or I might say in my populations, you know, in my population genomics experiments, you know, I know, I know what ethnic group patients come from, and I'm going to use that to, you know, influence how I call mutate, you know, how I call genotypes that are on the border of being, you know, a specific genotype state. And so at the point in time that we talk about these analyses, we, we do have to think about, though, how we're going to make it more productive to define these analyses and to run it. Uh, you know, and one of the big things that we always do in bioinformatics is complain about our file formats. And today has been, uh, you know, today has lived up to this hype. We've, we've done a lot of, uh, you know, we, we've talked about what are some of the problems uh, with these file formats, like BAM is not very easy to split. And part of the problem is that, you know, at the time, BAM was a, a really great decision. You know, it was ahead of the technology that, you know, some of the technologies that we've been talking about in terms of, you know, columnar storage didn't exist at the time. BAM was a good choice when, you know, when projects like Thousand Genomes were starting to ramp up. But, at, you know, right now when we look at this from 2015, it's, it's not necessarily the best choice. We, we're using a flat file format that is, you know, sacrificing interoperability and it isn't giving us anything in terms of performance or compression. Yeah, you know, when we look at a lot of the common pipelines that we're using right now, uh, you know, it's it's pretty frequent to see people complain that that reads aren't coming in the correct sorted order. Uh, you know, I, I sit on, I, I watch a few different uh, bioinformatics projects on GitHub, and it's you know, it's kind of every other week I see someone say, "Hey, you know, you're putting this in the wrong sort order." No, you're putting this in the wrong sort order, and uh, you know, fundamentally. This isn't actually something that's important. You know, how our data is stored on disk shouldn't determine, you know, whether our application throws an exception. You know, this is something that we should be able to handle at a higher up level. And this finally gets to this big problem that, you know, we're, we're using these genomics APIs. Well, we don't necessarily have great genomics APIs. You know, you know we're, we're talking a lot about Hadoop today and MapReduce as a, as a processing platform. And, MapReduce isn't really a great processing platform for defining how we're going to run some of these complicated algorithms. So, you know, what, the way that we see the world is that we need to start thinking, what do these patterns look like? And how can we make them, you know, easy to work on top of and easy to scale out? And so to this end, we've, uh, you know, at Berkeley we've been developing, uh, along with many open source collaborators, a system called Atom that we see as our building block for doing large-scale bioinformatics. 
And so Atom at its core is a open source Apache 2 licensed uh, distributed platform for running genomic analyses and it's built on top of the Apache Spark framework. So Atom, uh, you know, Atom defines three separate things and the, you know, the core of Atom actually is this data schema that we use for describing data. And then we've built a uh, programming interface on top of this that makes it easy to express computation that's, you know, many, many different genomic uh, patterns at a distributed setting. And then on top of that, we've built a, a few nifty command line tools. And really the guiding principle that we've, uh, we've been going with is that we want to use the way that we're describing our data as a narrow waste. So we actually, uh, we sit in a databases and networking systems lab at Berkeley. So uh, we, we kind of get the best of, best of both what the networking people and the database people have to say. And so database people, surprisingly enough, are really big on using schemas to achieve data independence. So as long as I know what, this, what the schema is, my database can make everything else that I'm doing go really fast. And the networking people, you know, anybody who's used IP or you're really the internet, you know, all of modern networking is enabled because people who, you know, who were very, very forward looking in the 80s said, hey, we're going to standardize on, some, on a variety of different protocols. We're going to use those to define a common narrow layer in the stack where we all interoperate. And that allows us to build many different techniques or technologies on top of things. And so, you know, kind of the general, you know, really the, the simple way to explain this if you're not a database or a, a, a networking person is that if I'm the person who is, you know, writing a new variant caller, or, you know, maybe I'm, I'm writing a, a peak caller, something like that, I don't care actually what the bytes on disk that represent my data are. I don't care where the data is stored. I don't care whether it's stored on a hard drive, some block store, an SSD, it lives in a memory cache. All that I care about is the application that I'm running, the data that I'm touching, and then how I'm saying that this application should be put together. And so, you know, so just to start at the core, what's our data format look like? So, uh, you know, so this is just a description of the schema. We use a, uh, a tool called Avro to uh, describe our data schema, and then this, this generates, um, you know, binary containers for serializing the data. So the big things to note, so this is, for example, our, uh, our schema for describing short reads. Uh, it's, if you're familiar with, you know, if you're intimately familiar with BAM or SAM, it's pretty much a direct copy. We're, we're not saying that we're innovating heavily in terms of what data that we're representing, but some of the important things, so, you know, we've talked a lot today about how we have this header in BAM that we can't split. Um, so all of the header fields that are in BAM have actually been fully, normal, like fully denormalized out into the record. And then we're doing a lot, of, a lot of work at the data storage level so that even though, you know, let's say I have 1.4 billion reads, you know, if I did this naively, I would replicate my header 1.4 billion times. But if we're smart about how we're storing our data on disk, if we're smart about how we're laying it out in memory, I make it look like I'm giving you this header 1.4 billion times, but I'm only storing it, you know, once per machine. And so by doing this, you don't have to say, hey, where's my header? You know, did it get copied to this machine correctly? You say, hey, I've got all the header information that I need right here. I have really fast access to it. I can use this. This is easy for me to reason about, easy for me to program on top of. Uh, you know, at the same point in time, we've done everything that we can to make you know, this, this record describing a read as dumb as possible. And whenever we need to, we enhance it with a variety of helper objects. So, you know, we have, you know, for example, ways of saying, hey, you know, right now, you know, maybe the most, the most compact way to store quality scores on, on disk is via, you know, via a string. But when I actually want to process them, you know, I want the integers, or I want maybe even the floating point probabilities that these refer to, you know, we have, we have some different um, rich objects, we call them, that'll go ahead at, uh, you know, at runtime and pull that out for you. And a lot of, um, you know, a lot of this work actually that we're doing here with the schemas, you know, for example, this normalizing this metadata, making it so that you have one copy of these per record, but it looks like you have, you know, it looks like you have one copy of these per record, but you really have one copy per machine. 
is done because we're using this project Parquet that was alluded to in an earlier talk. And so uh, Parquet is a uh, Apache incubator project, and it, it's actually based on a project at Google called Dremel. And so uh, Google about uh, five years ago, actually about seven years ago now, uh, realized that they had this big problem where they were, they were storing huge amounts of data and they needed to do interactive queries on it. Uh, so they, they went ahead and they built their own custom columnar store. They wrote it up and uh, you know, a bunch of people said, hey, you know, if Google's using it, it's probably pretty good. And so a, a team at Twitter said, hey, well, you know, this is a closed project only available at Google. We'd really like this. And they started rewriting it. They open sourced it. And uh, you know, now it's, it's freely available for everyone to use. And so what's significant about it, you know, so since it's columnar, you know, what this means is that I don't store this whole record as one contiguous chunk on disk. I would store all of the, you know, I would store all of the starts of the reads in one contiguous row. I would store you know, all of these metadata fields in one, you know, one contiguous section per row. So if I see that, hey, you know, everything has the same header information, then I can say, oh, well, you know, I was going to write out this header information, you know, and it's all the same. I was going to write it out 1.4 billion times in a row. When I'm writing it out, I say, oh, well, if it's just the same information, I'm just going to write it out once and then say, hey, you know, this was repeated 1.4 billion times. And the, uh, the other advantage of this is, you know, a lot of the time in genomics, we might have a workload, you know, for example, uh, you know, if I'm doing some quality control, maybe I only care about, you know, these flags that tell me whether a read was mapped, whether its pair was mapped, some information about the mapping quality then uh, I can easily say, hey, you know, just, give me the, just give me the mapping qualities. That's all that I care about. I don't, I don't want any of this, this information about the raw sequence. I don't want the quality scores. So hey, you know, we wind up doing, reading about 3% of the bytes on disk. And that, you know, that makes things, surprisingly enough, you know, about 50 times faster. At the same point in time, you know, I, I was mentioning earlier, you know, BAM, even though it's a compressed format, doesn't necessarily give us optimal compression. And there's, you know, a lot of people, for example, the CRAM team that have shown, hey, you can really beat BAM. Uh, but for us, even just by naively taking the exact BAM schema pretty much and storing it in Parquet, we're, um, you know, we're already 25% higher compression than BAM itself is. And uh, you know, one of the great things is that the way that Parquet does compression is partially based on you know, what each column has. So you know, if I have a column that is all repeated values, then well, I don't store the repeated value all the time. I just say, hey, this is a repeated value, store it once. But there's a bunch of other things that I can use, like dictionary encoding. And there's, there's a lot of standard interfaces that I can extend here if I say, hey, you know, this is a new compression scheme. This works really well for columns that are random text, but with a, you know, a small range of characters. And uh, you know, then I can, I can incorporate that into Parquet, and I can just pick up that benefit right there. Uh, and you know, so one of the things that we will note is, uh, so even though we have been working really hard on, you know, on uh, things that we can do with this columnar storage and our novel schemas to make things easy for the you know, bioinformatician working in the Hadoop world, uh, backwards compatibility is a really big problem. It's, uh, no one is interested in using a system that they can't get data into. People are even less interested in using systems they can't get data out of. Uh, so we've actually worked our API so that we do, you know, we do all of our conversion on read and write. So if you tell me, hey, I want to load this BAM file, then I will make it appear to you as if it's an Atom file stored in Parquet. I will load it straight from disk. I can save it back to disk in BAM format as well. Uh, so we're fully compatible with SAM, BAM, FASTQ for short reads. We're compatible with VCF, GVCF for uh, variant data. And then we also uh, support a wide variety of genomic annotation formats and um, you know, then kind of some other, other obvious things like storing, uh, you know, for example, assembled contigs. So we've, we've been working a, a you know, pretty hard on this, and we're, we're actually working to try to add support for people who have data stored in CRAM so that we can, you know, CRAM is, uh, actually does use a columnar representation on disk, so we've been trying to read natively from CRAM into our schema. 
And so, uh, you know, otherwise from an API design perspective, so as I mentioned earlier, we're built on top of Apache Spark. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, Spark is built around this one core concept of a resilient distributed data set, or an RDD for short. And uh, if you, you know, it's, it's a really cool abstraction. They have some brilliant papers written about it, but if, if you don't want to get diving deep into that, the way to think of it is that it just gives you a distributed array spread across a bunch of machines, but I can't see from one machine to another. So it's not like a shared memory computing environment. Uh, so on top of that, we've been saying, hey, what are some of the common primitives that we would like to use in genomics? And in some of the cases, they're aggregates. So if I'm running you know, base quality score recalibration, I want, re I want a table that says you know, what the information I'm summarizing, I want to aggregate that table up. If I'm running indel realignment, I'm going to want to aggregate together all of the regions that I want to run my indel realignment on from looking at the reads to see where I have uh, evidence of an indel. We've also been working a lot on, uh, on a primitive that we call you know, bucketing. So this is a way of grouping like items together um, most of the time by the alignment position. And so this is a common primitive for duplicate marking or if I want to see you know, how many reads are commonly, you know, if I, let's say I align with BWA, BWA mem, bow tie, I want to see how many reads are commonly aligned at the same position between each, then I can use this bucketing uh, primitive to, de to determine concordance of the read alignments, or, you know, in the common case, I can use it to also look at variance. And then uh, finally, one more that we've been working on uh, really hard is this concept of a region join. So I, I was bashing on sort order and variance earlier, but uh, you know, frequently we do say, you know, we, we have this, this, sorting, this uh, sorting invariant because, well, you know, the logical reality of things is that we map, we map stuff to the reference genome for a region. You know, it has these useful landmarks so that we can compare, you know, hey, you know, if I, if I called a variant, what reads overlap that? So what we've been working on is this region join primitive that says, hey, I don't care how the data is laid out on disk. But you tell me that you have an annotation at a site, or maybe you have a variant that you've called. You want to get all the reads that overlap that. I'll pull those together for you. So this is essentially saying, how can we get data that has this region layout? How can we get any points that overlap or situate at the same position without worrying about where they actually are on disk? And how can we do that fast? And uh, you know, kind of to that note of how can we do things fast, we, we've been, uh, you know, we've actually been building up a pipeline that's essentially the GATK's best practices pipeline, completely reinvented, built on top of Atom. And, uh, you know, I like to think that we're pretty fast. So even on a single node, we get about a 2 to 4x performance improvement for a lot of these tasks. Um, and we, we achieve linear scalability. We've tested up to 128 nodes. This is for... Uh, the NA12878 high coverage data set that's in the 1,000 genomes. This is about uh, 225 gigs of data. Uh, so we scale linearly out to 128 nodes. And um, you know, as, as I was mentioning earlier, even on a single node, we're, you know, at, at worst, we're competitive. At best, we're 2 to 4x faster. And we've actually made some upgrades. You know, the, the, the lagger here was our BQSR implementation. We've actually made some upgrades to how we're doing hashing when we're computing this aggregate table. So this, uh, I have this experiment rerunning right now, but we should be about 3x faster now. Uh, from an implementation perspective, so Adam's a, uh, you know, it's a uh, <laughs> project that's still under pretty fast uh, implementation. We're right now at somewhere between an alpha and a beta stage, probably leaning a bit more towards a beta. We have a you know, a couple more uh, improvements that we're hoping to make in time for some sort of a production release later this spring. We're about 27,000 lines of code written mostly in Scala, and we have uh, 33 people who've contributed to the core of Atom across uh, 12 institutions, and probably with a development core that's, you know, about five to 10 folks. Um, so if you're, if you're at any point in time interested, it's, you know, fully open. We love to have anyone contribute. We have a list of, uh, kind of low-hanging fruit on our GitHub issue page. So it's a great way to jump in if you're interested. And uh, it's also all Apache 2 licensed, so it's completely uh, non-viral licensing. The, uh, where I'm going to talk about the rest of this talk, though, is what we're, what we're thinking about downstream. 
So we're kind of in this aggressive spot where we're saying, hey, we think that the way that we're doing bioinformatics is broken. And if we're going to prove that with any sort of legitimacy, we have to say, what does this buy us if we start re-implementing these downstream analyses? You know, saying, hey, we've got an API and it's, it's good, we do things fast is cool, but uh, in, unless we make these analyses that people want to run work better, no one really cares. You know, it's, it's nice to be, you know, it's nice to say we're theoretically better, but are we better in the practical world? So we're uh, building out an ecosystem right now to try to, you know, to try to demonstrate where we're good, where we're bad, and learn from the system and incorporate improvements to add them as necessary. And so uh, one of my big focuses is this whole genome resequencing problem, or you know, more broadly, variant calling. And so we're, we're actually working on two different approaches. Uh, one is the traditional align, you know, the uh, alignment-based variant calling, and that's in a project called Avocado. And then the second is a more aggressive approach where we're saying, hey, you know, if we have, you know, we have new long read technologies like, you know, PacBio's, you know, you know, PacBio's more established now, but, you know, we have Oxford Nanopore coming along. These reads are very long. They're very different from short reads. They're a high error, you know, high error rate. But can we still use these reads to actually call variants via de novo assembly? Uh, that's a bit more aggressive of an approach, so, but we'll, we'll just focus on the avocado project today. And uh, you know, really, the way that I look at it right now, there's a, few big, there's a few big problems that we have. So one of them is that right now, a lot of our indel discovery algorithms are based around reassembly approaches. So you know, we align reads to a region, we reassemble that region, and then we, you know, we call variants after that's cleaned up any issues with local misalignment. Uh, unfortunately, reassembly is really expensive right now. I think you know everybody is used to running you know you know, haplotype caller instead of unified genotyper and seeing their you know their analysis times blow up by a factor of you know 10 to 50. Uh, that's not great. At the same point in time, we also you know you know we have this this uh, joint variant calling problem where we want to integrate over a large collection of samples, and this isn't this isn't anything unique to our work. Um, this is just, this is a reality of uh, a variant analysis. And then finally, this, there's one last problem that I'll touch on briefly today, but we're starting to understand that the reference genome is less representative than we like to think that it is. So, you know, the latest release of the, you know, the human genome reference has alternate sequences for a few, you know, very challenging areas. Uh, and while we have these alternate sequences, we don't really know what to do with them in the practice of variant calling yet. So we need, to, we need to figure out what we're going to do about this and how we're going to incorporate it into our analysis. And so the, the big thing that we're focusing on in Avocado is how to make, how to make this De Bruyne graph reassembly process more efficient. Uh, so, you know, for a lot of these high accuracy variant callers right now, you know, the GATK, Platypus, uh, Scalpel, you know, we're performing this reanalysis process or reassembly process where if we, if we detect that a region is poorly locally aligned, we just go ahead and realign that or reassemble that before we call variants. And so typically we've been using a De Bruyne graph. I believe the GATK has recently switched to an overlap graph. They think that that gets them better, uh, you know, better accuracy in a region at the cost of uh, you know, higher computational cost. But even the De Bruyne graph itself is pretty expensive. And if we look at that, part of the reason is because what we're doing right now is that we elaborate all of the paths that we think are at some level of sufficient likelihood to be a true path through the graph. We score those paths, and then we finally realign. And so, uh, you know, finding all paths through the graph is, is fairly expensive. You know, we wind up doing a depth first search. Uh, we then, you know, once we've picked out our H haplotypes, we then realign every single read to every single haplotype. So we're doing, you know, HN realignments. And then the cost of doing this, re this realignment depends on the length of the haplotype and the length of the read. Uh, so, you know, we, if we look at this entire process, we're already getting out to something like order for, you know, runtime complexity, which is not, you know, for those of us who are, you know, computer scientists who look at the theory of algorithms, you know, normally if we see an, an algorithm that's like big O N to the four, we get kind of uncomfortable. Uh, and, and a lot of the problem here is that we're doing this realignment to identify, you know, which of these, which of these haplotypes is, a, is the best haplotype or which two haplotypes are the best haplotype pair. 
So our big goal is to say, can we just eliminate this realignment step? You know, why are we looking for all of these different haplotypes? Why don't we just look for all of the different alleles? Because if I have the alleles, then I can score haplotypes later through a statistical process. And so essentially the big thing that we've done is that we've gone ahead and we've come up with, a, with an approach that is you know, just bound through what the cost of walking the graph is to determine all of the alleles that we have, have found. And so there, there's a few, uh, a few nice properties. One is that we're actually not doing any realignment. We're just noticing where the alleles are, what the reads that contributed to those alleles are, and then we don't have to realign specific reads. We don't have to identify the top you know, two haplotypes in a region. We're also able to, uh, you know, you know, essentially what we're doing is we're looking at the structure of bubbles. So you know, if I have this this T, you know, T, or I guess a G to T uh, SNP here, you know, I'm noticing, hey, you know, this T here creates a second bubble. So we're just looking for this, this bubble structure. And this is, a, you know, this is a strategy that's been used before in the de novo assembly world, you know, for example, in the, in the Velvet and the Cortex projects. And one of the nice things is that if we, if we just look at the structure of these bubbles, we can actually come up with representations of these alleles that are provably canonical. Uh, you know, so there, there's kind of this common problem where if I have a six base, you know, like if I have a six base insertion, there may be many different ways that I can express that. You know, it, it's possible that I can break that up into a four base insertion, you know, a two base SNP, and then something later, yeah, it, it's essentially like for, for certain classes of indel variants, there is not one definitively correct you know, alignment, but here if we reassemble with the reference as a prior, we can actually come up with a provable representation. And uh, the proofs are too long for the slides. Uh, we're working on a manuscript with them right now. If you're interested in them, you know, please get in touch with me, I'll gladly share them offline. Uh, we actually, actually, I think we have them in the documentation in our repository. So, uh, but anyways, you know, this really gets at this whole big problem where, yeah, you know, I'm just going to show you 200 bases from the NA12878 um, read data set uh, as a De Bruyne graph form. And what you'll notice is that even though we're looking at 200 bases and we, ro we probably want to reassemble something much longer than that, um, this graph is pretty ugly. So, you know, in this 200 base section, we have 3,000 unique 20 mers and over 30 valid paths. So if I say, I don't want to just reassemble 200 bases, you know, maybe I want to reassemble a 1,000 base chunk, you can see where, where this complexity is really starting to blow up, and this is why realignment's slow. Uh, yeah, and then, so finally, once we get to the genotyping stage, one of the big things that we've been working in, in Atom is to you know, do these kind of sliding traversals over the reference genome. And so you know, what you might say is, let's say this is my reference genome at the top, and then these are a bunch of reads that I've observed in this location, and you know, this is how I've you know, aligned the specific alleles that I have you know, noticed in the reads. All that we're doing is we wind up using the sliding window traversal where we say, hey, you know, I just want to look at all of the alleles that are open at a single site when I run my genotyping. So uh, we, we found a way to make that pretty fast in a distributed setting. Uh, right now we're just using a simple model that's actually based off of the SAM tools and pile up um, approach. So we don't have any, anything exciting there yet, but what we are moving to is this, this approach that we're calling an allele graph. Um, and so the idea here is that we would represent, you know, if I have a C versus A SNP, you know, I, I look at this in, you know, kind of as a graph that I'm walking through. So, you know, if I, if I wound up having, you know, two haplotypes at this location that, you know, kind of diverge down this path, that, that would be encoded in my graph. And then inside of here, we actually, uh, you know, the evidence that we see in the reads, we encode as conditional probabilities for each edge going through the graph, and then we can efficiently, um, you know, we can efficiently identify the, well, we can efficiently marginalize the probabilities in this, in this region of the graph by running a belief propagation algorithm. So this, this winds up being a reasonably, uh, reasonably efficient implementation of, uh, you know, a probabilistic model that incorporates, you know, haplotype information, and then we can later, um, 
you know, incorporate any of the population level statistics just with a traditional EM approach. That's you know, pretty common in a lot of the variant callers right now. Um, so you know, there's, uh, there's still a bit of future work. So we have, you know, we have a lot of this implemented. We're still going through and testing, um, you know, both for performance and for accuracy. You know, in terms of performance right now, we appear to be you know, in line with uh, you know, current high performance tools, but I, I wish I had better numbers than that. I was in a bit of a scramble this week to get some other performance write-ups done. So uh, you know, the vagarities of peer review. Um, but otherwise, one of the big things that we're working on is this flexible concept of multiple region assembly. So uh, you know, in our De Bruyne graphs right now, you know, we're going ahead you know, and we're just using a single, or <laughs> so you know, in our De Bruyne graphs right now, we're uh, threading this with, yeah, well, in any case, I'll skip that and come back to it later. But um, yeah, we're, we're using a single reference at a time to evaluate the reads in a region, but with these, um, you know, with these, multi, you know, with these alternate regions that are now in, in assemblies, you know, we might want to say, hey, you know, we know that this region of the alt lines up with this region of the actual, you know, the main chromosome, and we'll bucket the alt and the main chromosome together, and then we'll use uh, both of the assemblies or you know, both of the, you know, the main and the alternate assembly to, you know, just to clean up the alignments in that region. And then uh, we're also working to evaluate the performance and accuracy of this approach on the Illumina um, Platinum pedigree, as well as the 1000 Genomes Project. So uh, yeah, I just want to thank, we have many collaborators on this